and that's when I heard my name and, and I, it was a familiar sound. So when I turned around, it was my mother and she was at the bottom of the stairs. So I turned around before I'd knocked on the door. So she had just caught me before knocking on the door or opening the door or whatever I was doing. And so I ran down to greet her only she grabbed me and she turned around and ran. And there was a car waiting around the corner with her new husband in it. It was, the car was running and they were ready for a quick getaway. So when she saw me going back to my babysitter's house, she jumped out of the car, ran up, called my name, grabbed me, and then ran me back to the car. And when she put me in the front seat with, you know, in front of her, between her and her new husband, as she's pushing me in and following behind me, she's telling me, this is your new daddy. Oh. It's totally validated in stealing another man's child based mm. off of what he was told. He felt that he was in the right to steal someone's child. Mm. The courts feel that they are justified in doing the same thing based on what they were told. Had they done their job, had they followed their own laws and their own, you know, their own criteria, yeah. I would have been reunited with my father at the age of eight. The age of eight. So the state Failed. let me down. Mm. And I hold them equally responsible for this whole catastrophe. Mm. I'm dead if I stay in that house. Well, she must have realized what I was doing because she went back out the front door and caught me at the corner of the house. And she lifted me up off of my bike by my neck. Oh, my God. Pulled me up off the bike, and she was crushing my throat. Well, I know that it's easy to live in denial. And I know that for other people out there that are like me, if they're not thinking that it's important, there might be a little bit of denial going on because I know there's a spot inside that we all have that we're protecting, but it's the curiosity. Like, I really want to know, but I'm afraid to ask. Yeah. Or I really want to know, but I'm so angry at this whole situation. I don't think I need to deal with it. Mm. But if you can imagine that I'm full of holes, 50% of me has holes. And those holes are painful. And there's nerve endings around the outside edges of all these holes, right? And in order to dull that pain, I have to stuff stuff in there. I have to kind of like pack it. So I'm not feeling that pain. And mm. we grow up packing these holes and it's a paper thin filling that makes it appear like we don't have holes, that we're a whole person until something happens. And you're like, okay, this, this pain is real. Mm -hmm. And when I found my father, I was able to pull off that paper thin layer and take out that stuffing. And I was able to replace it with the unconditional love that I never realized that he still had for me. So now those holes are really filled with love and, mm. and who I am. I have the answers to all those curiosity questions. I know who my family is now. I did DNA tests and they reached out to me and said, who are you? You know, and I, I now know who my other half of my world is. I was able to go on a family trip, family reunion road trip, and I went and met them. Yeah, there's a real value to your, um, to your experiences in bringing in children and bringing in young people who are you know find themselves at the forefront of these issues you know mm -hmm. because they don't know what's happening to them like day to day right. they don't they they can't see it because you didn't see it you thought that was your you know you were like happy to see your mum your mum grabs you and chucks you in a car and says this is your new daddy so then you don't go hang on a minute i'm calling the cops Right. You yeah, know, right. <laughs> you're, not, you're not equipped to do that as a as a as a as a four year old, as an eight year old, as a 12 year old. You're not you don't have those, you, you know, you don't have the armory to do that. So now you're giving your message. I, I feel there's a huge value in you being able to, mm -hmm. you know, I think of um, I think of all the people that I've spoken to and what it would have been if their children as well would have just had an avenue to this kind of um, understanding as to what is what is going on and why it's not 
it's not always cool not to see daddy and it's not always cool not to see mummy on a train and a bus in a car on the way to your job all alone with your kids with your wife or with your dog you can listen anywhere you can listen everywhere to the philip malone maloney podcast Hi, welcome back to the latest instalment of the Philip Maloney podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined by Dawn Andrea McCarty. Uh, Dawn is a cyber security specialist, uh, mother of two, um, and uh, she joins me today from sunny Florida. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, it's it's great that we've been able to uh, get together and uh, have a have a have a nice conversation around. Um, uh, how um, our paths have crossed, et cetera, which leads us into your uh, amazing story, which I hope the viewers are going to find um, compelling. And uh, obviously, you know, spoiler alert, you're still here. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you're, and you're very much alive. Um, uh, uh, yep. Because part, uh, part of the story is uh, uh, you had a, your very own missing poster at one point. Yeah, yeah, yes, I did. Um, I didn't see the original. I've never seen the original. Um, so the the missing poster came in at a later point, actually, when I was doing my criminal justice final. And yeah. the final was on childhood abductions and human trafficking. Now, I knew that I had been abducted as a child, but it was always a joke. So it wasn't really something I took seriously because everybody always laughed about it. And then when I was working on the final, I found a group of people that had the exact same story I had. And I started thinking, well, wait a minute, this, what is this? And I actually went and met with them and I sat and participated in a study that was actually done out of um, the London Metropolitan University. That may not be exactly correct, but I can look it up. Um, and this lady came and she sat with all of us and she was studying the long-term effects of childhood abduction. And I started learning that, oh my gosh, this was not cool. This was not right. This was a, you know, bad thing. Yeah. And it was yeah. no longer a joke. And my final paper actually became about me. Wow. Yeah. The whole paper was my own I'm, story. I'm not surprised at all, actually, because um, uh, from what we've, uh, you know, we've, we've obviously had introduction conversations, et cetera, but I've, I've, I've found your story fascinating. And we will we will be definitely going into uh, uh, a real deep dive um, around around what happened to you. Um, but I wanted to uh, look around your your lovely area there and look at some of the things that um, probably give us a little bit of an insight into uh, in, in, into your life. I see you've got some uh, some nice candles, stars. Uh, there's a fish tank as well. Is there anything there with a particular story or relevance to uh, to best describe well, you? Um, there is a lot, you know, that I bring in the elements, you know, so I have a little bit of water, I have a little bit of metal, you know, the, the grounding elements, right? Ah, okay. um, a lot of the stuff that you see on the bookcases are, are things that I have either written myself, things that I am involved in. So like I have the CISSP, which is part of my cybersecurity side. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a lot of the parental alienation type books. I have um, the one written, written by Dr. Bill Burnett. Um, I have books that other people have written that I use, and sometimes I display depending on who I'm interviewing. So if I interview them, then I display the book if I have it. So, I mean, this background kind of changes with me, and it's kind of like my zen and my mood. So, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it, it it certainly looks inviting. It certainly looks yeah. inviting. Um, but I there's like a, that. So uh, you're quite a spiritual a, person. One little, sorry, mm. I didn't mean to. There's one little um, additional piece of comfort that brings this whole setup brings is that the fish tank is uh used to belong to my late father right so it you know it, he's at my back he's got my back and he's also right here with me because i'm sitting at his desk as i do my interviews and as i talk to people i'm at i'm sitting at his desk so i'm about my father's work in a sense <laughs> okay so your father um like all fathers are very important uh, or is very important to you and uh, was was very important to you. So um, 
what was your earliest, earliest memories of your father? Surprisingly, I have a very vivid memory of certain aspects. I don't remember everything, but I, I, I distinctly remember the, um, things way back to when I was two years old. Wow. And there, I've had people say, "Oh, you couldn't possibly remember that," but I can describe, I can describe the environment, the setting. I know exactly what our apartment looked like. I can describe it to a T. The layout. I know what color our couch was. I knew what the building looked like. I know that there was a swimming pool in the middle. It was a U-shaped apartment, two stories, and it was wow. white. I mean, I I remember all these things, and I was trying to um, figure out why would I remember s- certain aspects. And I think because when I was ripped out of one world and thrown into another, that was my brain's way of saying that uh, it was holding on to the memories mm. that I had so that it um, it would help me in the in this foreign world I was all of a sudden in. my I call it my personal twilight zone. So this world was not real. My brain attached to those memories because those were real. Yeah. So I have very strong memories about certain things. And I remember um, going on trips. I remember going over and actually visiting my mother after she had left. She moved out and moved into another apartment. And my dad and I would go and try and visit her. And I remember the last time we tried to visit her. And I can I remember her apartment, too. I can describe it in the areas that I was in anyway. And we weren't there for very long. And then when we left, you know, I always left with my dad. Mm. She never, she never tried to keep me. There was never any argument over any of that. So I always went home with my dad. He was my sole caretaker and she was done. And that was, that particular moment was the last time I saw her um, before she left the state. And then for about a two year period. So you've got this very, um, very vivid childhood memories around um, certain interactions between your mother and your father. Do you have any um, do you have any memories of when your mother and father were together at all? And now that might be stretching stretching things because obviously if you were around to what two years old when when your when your mm-hmm. parents split up? Yeah, and I don't think um, I don't have a lot of memories of them together because I don't think at that particular point I needed to. So when mm. You know, I think there was a reason why I had the memories following that. But up until that point, I remember th- I remember some things. Like I remember standing in the crib um, up against the window. There was a curtain there. And I actually have pictures of me standing in this crib that I never saw mm. until I found my dad. So it was kind of ironic to have a memory and then have a photo appear that was so close to that memory. It's It's a little different. But, yeah. you know, because time kind of fades things, but it was it was very validating in um, um, knowing that those memories are real. They're not they weren't implanted. They weren't imagined. You know, I actually have the photo that just kind of warmed my heart and, you know, made me feel like, wow, I, I do have a strong memory of that. Yeah. yeah so I remember incredible. there was a lot. There was always something going on. They managed the apartment building that we lived in. And I remember they would knock on doors and ask for the rent and I would knock on doors and I'm in two, I'm still in diapers and I'm knocking on doors because I'm mimicking what they're doing. And I would ask people for cookies and candy. So, (laughs) I mean, everybody in this apartment complex knew me. They knew who I was. They knew when I come and knock on the door, I'm looking for something. And, you know, we had at the time, the Green Bay Packers were spring Um, training and they would a lot of them would stay in this apartment complex this is Hollywood California so Mm. um, we had a lot of players that were staying in the apartment complex and I remember there was one family and I I don't remember specifically if they were actually a Green Bay Packer so I'm not I'm not trying to say that but yeah um, I remember that there was a family that invited us over for dinner and they asked me if I'd like to come in. They don't have cookies and candy, but they have some soul food. And so my mom was calling me and I stuck my head through the bars, you know, the the railing, the mm-hmm. old fashioned iron railing. 
And I looked down at her and I told her, we invited for soul food. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, some of the memories I have are fun and entertaining. Yeah. Um, and then there's, there's um, not a lot of the bad memories. I don't, I cannot picture any of um, like the arguing. I remember there was a commotion one day and that was the day she left, mm. but I can't really picture it out in my head. Sure, sure. So to to all intents and purposes, you were shielded from that um, one way or another, which is right. which is good, which is good. So that's um, that's really interesting that you have those that you have those really vivid recollections. I think that's uh, that's quite telling, um, you know, when we when we sort of drill down to the to the rest of your story. So um, so you're about two years old. You're uh, you're now sort of what living with your dad you say your dad was was living with my dad in the same apartment so we never moved he never tried to hide me mm -hmm. she she left when I was about two and um, we don't know if I was two almost three but somewhere somewhere in there um and then she moved into another apartment and then eventually she left the state and moved to Colorado and right. then the, so that's... geographically how far away is Colorado from Hollywood California so that's about probably 1500 2000 miles i'm guessing cuz i i'm not even looking at a map but okay. you know um la county or la los angeles and hollywood are in the southern area southern region of california mm -hmm. and colorado is kind of towards the midsection of the country yeah. so and it's further north obviously but okay so a geographical perspective from us here in the uk uh that's almost twice the length of the United Kingdom, um, that sort of, you know, 2000 miles or what have you, that's probably, that's probably double the size of the United Kingdom. So that's not like a mother moving from London to Manchester, which would be very inconvenient to drive to, but yeah, so 2000, 2000 odd miles away. Okay. So that's quite, that's quite a distance. When did she, when did, or when did you find out she had moved or, I guess I didn't really know that she moved because I know that we went to see her in that apartment and then she just, you know, disappeared. Right. So she left us. Um, and I don't know that I, um, I know I wondered where's mom or, you know, but I wasn't as close to her yeah. from the get go. We never had that really tight bond, not like the bond I had with my dad. Right. So like I can, I'm familiar with that with him, but I'm not familiar with that with my mom, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for whatever reason that was, there just wasn't a bond there. Um, and you being a baby, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily down to you to create that or to, to work on that. Um, yeah. Okay. So well, there's so... actually something we just, I've just been working on and, um, this was work, you know, with the, with what I've been through, it's constant work. So mm -hmm. things that I go through now as an adult, all of that didn't go away. It's things that I constantly have to work on still. So I'm working very closely with somebody and we went back clear into the womb. And what we realized is that for the first five months that my mom was pregnant, she didn't even acknowledge that, that she was pregnant. She didn't either. She didn't know she was pregnant or maybe she thought she was pregnant, but I don't know. But for the first five months, she didn't know she was pregnant by claim or she mm -hmm. didn't want to acknowledge. So I wasn't even acknowledged for the first five months of her pregnancy. And then wow. she had me at eight months. So we're talking about the time that a baby bonds with the mother is during the pregnancy. And it's usually instantaneously. Once the mom finds out, then it's this, you know, all of these feelings start happening. And this mom mm. and baby have a connection that's internal. And I don't think that I had that part. So I think that's where the bond was um, not developed. In, yeah, in a sense that most most babies are they're they're experiencing that bonding with their mother from the minute that they're realized that they're acknowledged right so that's an interesting that's an interesting um parallel tangent um almost so were you doing some sort of regression therapy uh to 
sort of work through this? Kind of. Um, we're we're going through what is it that um, what is it that I really feel, and in kind of dissecting each of the emotions. And because I talk a lot about what I call my straight A's, I'm actually writing a book called My Straight A's. Mm -hmm. And most people think of it as, oh, I got straight A's in school. And my straight A's begin with abandonment. Right. And the second A I got was abduction. But now we're going back even further. And the first A wasn't necessarily abandonment. It was acknowledgement. Right. So we're, we're lining all these up and figuring out what is it that people like me experience and what are we carrying into our adulthood and how is that affecting how we parent or how we bond or how we have meaningful relationships? How do we deal with conflict? How do we deal with stress? How do we deal with all of these things that, you know, our body's keeping the score and that there's a book actually about that. And I, I totally 100% agree with that because my body has been keeping the score as well. And there's so many things that don't just disappear. There's, there's a myth and I would love to bust the myth. Mm. There, there is no such thing as a child getting over it once they turn 18. That just does not happen. Yeah. There's no such thing. Yeah. So it's a constant piece of baggage or constant burden that the child continues on into their adulthood with. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's a scar, right? It's, uh, yeah. it's something and you that don't, stays, you may not even know it. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a really interesting sort of, um, uh, sort of concept around the issues, um, of parental alienation. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a very interesting dynamic, um, uh, and one that only someone in your position could tell because you are mm -hmm. a child of parental alienation in one of the most severe ways that I've ever come across or or, or heard about. Yeah. So um, I guess deep breath, let's let's go into yeah. it. Well, that's but, why I'm sharing this because mm -hmm. there I've heard some horrific things that are said by parents, of course, because there's there's a high conflict there, but also by our court systems and what they yeah. think will happen and telling parents certain things. Like I've heard parents are told, just wait until they turn 18, they'll come back. That's, that's a myth mm. that doesn't happen. That does not automatically happen. You cannot rely on the kid having the solution and the court system is kind of imposing that on the child and providing a false hope to parents that, okay, I just have to wait a while because mm. if there's no nurturing, if there's no interaction, then the child really has no need or no familiarity and no purpose to really come back and look for that because they may be stimulated in another way. And until the child realizes that this stimulation is only the band aid to make me feel like I'm a whole person, and they really start digging in and doing the work because that's where I was. You think you're okay. Yeah. But if you don't know this whole half of you, you're not okay because you don't know who you are. And that is where all of these myths are really damaging and harming the child's ability to be the whole person they were intended to be and to thrive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so flippant for the courts to use that as a kind of kick the can down the road. Um, Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, answer for 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 parents who, you know, for, and shame for, on them for insinuating. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think I think that when when parents go to um, the family courts, most of them go with the with the very, very best of intentions for help and healing, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and some sort of higher authority. To and they be able come to... out of adversaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're just and I don't want to jump off off your track of what you want to talk to. But no, one no quick little scenario that I think sure. really paints the picture is one of the court cases we had here recently in the last year or two. Um, I listened to it and what I heard people actually say was that the the scenario was one parent didn't want the child to have to 
take all that time to have to go visit the other parent. And so the argument from the attorney was, why should this poor child have to drive a whole hour to go see the other parent? And that really kind of enraged me that that was the argument. You're using the child to win an argument in court, yeah. which is wrong all in itself. And that could take me days to, to finish that conversation. But what I want to get down to is talking about the numbers. So the numbers, you if you take my example, and we'll get into my stories that people help put the pieces together, but it took me 44 years to find my father. So if I had an opportunity as a child, if the choice was even there, that I would have had to go an hour each way to visit my other parent. If you take that away from me, that one hour and that one hour a week, we were talking about, so one hour there, one hour back. So two hours a week, yeah. how many weeks are in a year? There's 52 hours, yeah. you know, 52 weeks in a year. So now we're, we're talking about 104 hours that I was robbed because mm -hmm. of that or I was robbed of visiting my dad because of this 104 hours. Mm -hmm. So then how many years did I miss yeah, because of that? So then you start seeing the numbers build and that is where they're, um, they're not calculating this correctly because they're, they're talking about me missing one hour of my mm -hmm. life. I missed 44 years of my father. So that one hour I would have, I would give anything at this point mm. to have that one hour to and from, if I would have had the opportunity to see my father, that one hour is a small price to pay for me to yeah. continue to have access to him. So they can't be, they cannot use these examples and more or less place it on the kid using the kid as their leverage and then cut them out, cut the other parent out of the, their lives. Yeah. And, you're it just it's 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 totally sensible when you look at a solicitor you want them to sort of put forward an intelligent argument but if they're putting forward a weaponized um you know uh, a child who's weaponized over a period of time to see the father you know this should be a non-starter it shouldn't even be able to get off the shouldn't be able to get off the ground but you know that that kind of but we just see it in family courts constantly these silly little you know he gives them uh he he gives the kids um cereal that they don't like right all that is just overcompensation from parents mm. because they want to make their child happy they mm. want their child to have a good time because they want them to keep wanting to be there so i understand why one parent might offer ice cream when mom doesn't allow it or dad you know doesn't allow this but mom does and mm. that's just part of the game when you got a divorce that's yeah. you just you have to deal with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, you know it's it's like it's like what happens in vegas stays in vegas you know what yeah. happens at mum house mum's house they, you know that's what happens at mum's house you got to stop but, one up in each other and start being a, you know parallel parents equal parents yeah instead of competing with each other start working yeah. together for your child. And I know that's easier said than done in some cases. So by no oh. means am I dismissing Let's the conflict. Let's just say that that is always going to be the parents' arguments, but that should never be always. the argument within the courthouse. You know, that should never be accepted. Uh, you know, the tittle-tattle, as it exactly. were. Exactly. Yeah. They shouldn't be the participants in it. They should be, you know, uh, um, I, I see some areas where they use mediation and help the parents to have... Um, uh, find a way to still have communication that's healthy. Mm. And I think that is, that should be implemented, but our court systems aren't, they're not equipped for that. But I, I didn't mean to take you down no, no, no. the whole well, side it, trail, but it, <laughs> we got a lot of rabbit holes here. <laughs> it's the world. It's the world over. That's the scary thing, Dawn. It's not mm -hmm. even in your county. Exactly. It's not even in your country. It's in, it's in my country. Global. It's in, yeah, it's in my um, uh, county, etc. Uh, yeah, it's a global, global issue, um, which is mm -hmm. which is really scary when you think about it, because people either bury their heads in the sand, haven't come across it yet, or um, are just yeah completely oblivious around around the issue. They just don't want to tackle it, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know there's That's a number. Fair. 
yeah yeah that there's a number of sort of conflicts around it um but yeah okay well let's let's uh, let's let's get back on track here um from from what i from our, what i remember in our conversations you um were about 4 years old when things took a very very um dark turn in your life so um, yeah. just to catch up from what we were saying before you were around 2 when your mother left and mm -hmm. you were living with your father. Yep. And okay. she had been gone for quite a while now. So I'm more or less used to her not being there. And so it was a morning that my father was already at work and I was, I was going to the babysitter's house. Now, mind you, everybody knew who I was at this apartment complex and the, my babysitter lived there too. And I don't know what time of day it was. So I'm not sure if I was, already at the babysitter's house and I was just outside playing or there was times I remember I would go home and get something and then come back to the babysitter's house. And, you know, this was in, you know, early seventies. So we didn't have the, the concerns and rules and laws that we have today as far as children being left alone. And I wasn't really left alone. I was still within, you know, the same, the na same neighborhood. So um, same vicinity. I was going back up to my babysitter's house and that's when I heard my name and, and I, it was a familiar sound. So when I turned around, it was my mother and she was at the bottom of the stairs. So I turned around before I'd knocked on the door. So she had just caught me before knocking on the door or opening the door or whatever I was doing. And so I ran down to greet her only she grabbed me and she turned around and ran and there was a car waiting around the corner with her new husband in it, it was, the car was running and they were ready for a quick getaway. So when she saw me going back to my babysitter's house, she jumped out of the car, ran up, called my name, grabbed me, and then ran me back to the car. And when she put me in the front seat with, you know, in front of her, between her and her new husband, as she's pushing me in and following behind me, she's telling me, this is your new daddy. And I'm, I'm, I can remember, you know, bracing and trying to back up. And I'm thinking, that's like what not was my going daddy. Through your mind. Yeah, that's not my daddy. And she's telling me that this is my daddy. And I'm like, that is not my daddy. And that is a huge memory for me. And I remember he had this huge mustache and the pilot sunglasses. And I did not know what was going on. I mean, all of a sudden my mom's back and now all of a sudden I'm being thrown into a car. So once we were in the car... They, they sped off and we ended up going down towards San Diego, which is even further south, almost mm -hmm. to the Mexico, Mexico border. And we hit out on a houseboat there. So this was a very planned, very calculated planned event. So they had resources available to them that included a car because they flew down from Colorado. And then they flew down almost immediately after they had gotten married. So this was between... March 20th, 1972, and July 16th, because July 16th, I'd turned five. So now, you know, we're, we're somewhere in that time frame, and the resources that they had was a houseboat, and the houseboat, we, w we stayed on for about a week until they felt safe enough when the investigation was dying down to move me from the houseboat to an airport. And then when we got to the airport, there was a plane that was already ready to taxi and take off as soon as I was on board. So once I was on board, they closed the door and wheels up, we were off. And that was the last time I was in California. And instantly, that world became a memory. And then I was forced into this new world where everything was brand new. The only thing I, that was familiar to me was my mother. I had a new bed, I had new toys, new clothes, I had a new daddy now, a new house. No, nothing that I had came with me. I had mm. no no comfort or no, you know, no chance to say goodbye. The babysitter didn't know where I was. So this LA and Hollywood are going berserk looking for this missing child who wasn't really missing. Because somebody knew where she was. But they expended all of these efforts to find a missing child. Now this is before the Amber Alerts and I'm believing that this was even before 
right before the first milk carton. Do you remember the milk cartons? Right, missing right. children's yeah, well, faces I see on those it. On, on mm -hmm. It was yeah. before that, right. so there was no real way of um, broadcasting this like like we do today. Yeah. So now I'm in Colorado with all this new stuff. And then all of a sudden I had this new family. I had a new daddy, but he also had a 10 year old daughter who was six years older than I am. Mm. And she was going through her own hell and didn't like her father remarrying. And then she finds out that her new father has a daughter on top of that. So from that point for the next eight years, I was violently abused by her to the point where she, she's tried to kill me. She strangled me to death, which nearly succeeded. And we can get into more of that detail in a, in a bit so we can keep talking about this part of the transition. Um, but once I arrived there and all this stuff was new, I never received any help. I didn't get any therapy. I didn't get any help with the transition and understanding what just took place. Granted, I'm four, almost five years old. People have the assumption that children are so resilient that they just grow and you know grow out of whatever their trauma was, yeah. which is not true. They they internalize everything. So I believe for those eight years that I was a punching bag, that my purpose was to be all that that showed me. So the the abuse and the neglect because my mother still wasn't a motherly figure. She never was. She never knew how to be. So we didn't ever um, increase the bond because right. I was more of a nuisance and someone that she told often to go play, get away, you know, don't come back till six, which used to be okay to say yeah. that. I yeah. can see you have a question. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, so I wanted you to, um, so obviously there was this two year period between your mother leaving you and your father and going and obviously moving up to Colorado. So what happened, what do you know of, um, or what was the sort of sense of why your mother would then come back and abduct you with, with, with this man? That's a great question because I've, I've, I know what I was told and I know what I've discovered. So we have two different sides here now where mm. they had, she had just gotten married to somebody that she hasn't known for very long, but right. she had told him that she, um, that my father was a dangerous person. And then when he found out that she had a daughter, which in his own words, in a book that he wrote, he didn't even know she had a daughter until after they were married. Right. So that right there is telling. And then when he found out that she had a daughter and she's telling him what a horrible person this father is, of course, he's going to want to do everything he could to rescue her turns daughter. Into, that's the perfect so, word. He turns yeah. into a rescuer. So he thinks he's on this rescue mission mm. and he sets up because he had connections with people from, you know, because he was a pilot. They actually, both of my fathers were pilots. Right. So they, they're very similar in a lot of ways, you know, mm -hmm. even to their, um, they, they even look like they could maybe be brothers. They were so identical, shaped okay. the same way, looked the same way. Both were pilots, you know, both charismatic, both, you know, like to have fun and entertaining and very okay. similar. So, it didn't so your mom had me. a type. She has a type. Mm. So, um, when when he found out about that, that's when they set up the plan to go down and abduct me. And when they finally got me back home, it was a couple of weeks, according to my mom. But the police finally showed up and knocked on the door and they asked her if she knew where I was. And her response was, she, yeah, yes, she's here with me, but she's my daughter. Mm. And so I became a possession yeah. in her mind. So the police were like, we understand that. However, you could have let her father know because they, he feared that she was dead in a ditch. And not only that, you allowed the investigation to go on. We spent tons of money, tons mm. of resources. All of this didn't need to happen had you just told somebody. 
So she even admitted to that part. She she actually told me that was her sharing that stuff with me. Right. And oh, this is conversational between the two of you. Yeah. At a, at a, as as I was growing up, th- these right. little bits come come yeah. out, and she would say, "Yeah, but you were my daughter." So that's she feels still, totally. Still yep. She feels totally validated in doing what she did because she's the mom. Okay. And, and they were never that. married legally, so she feels like she had the power. Right, right. And um, did the police press any charges or anything like that? No, they didn't press any charges. And I'm not sure why or if there was a a path to press charges. Since they were never married, my father didn't think he had any legal recourse. Right. Even though he was on the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. So, but his, he didn't feel like he um, stood a chance to, to fight and especially now that I'm in another state. So yeah. she actually crossed state lines with me, which today that could be that could be illegal or that is illegal. Yeah. You can't just take your kid out of a state. So what happened then is illegal now. Yeah. You know, the abuse then definitely illegal now. So she uh she got away with she got away with it because yeah. it wasn't really prevalent back then. It wasn't spoken about. We didn't speak about stuff like this. I don't think there's much change in people, you know, taking their chances on on doing things and playing a certain type of card um, that sort of gets them mm, yeah. through these situations. I mean, if you talk to anybody today, a neighbor, who do you think is going to get custody of a child when there's a divorce? It's still the narrative is the mother, right? It, there's no narrative of there should be 50-50 custody um, yeah. unless you're talking to, unless you happen upon a, you know, a person who knows a little bit about this. Um, it's it's the assumption that the mother will have the, the children, regardless of how she conducts yeah. herself or goes about it. Because she, the role she plays, she's the nurturer and she, mm. you know, a lot of moms, and I can even identify with some of this having my own children, is that there's such a bond there because they they came from you. Mm-hmm. And that nine-month period was an intimate period. And not to – and, of course, I support fathers being involved 100%, so not to negate from that. But the fathers aren't really in that same connection which the more involved they are in the pregnancy, the the more bond and strength they build. So I love to see fathers getting right in there when they when their when their family as a family are pregnant, mm-hmm. having that interaction and that involvement and him participating and him knowing every moment, having communication about what's going on inside, yeah. that builds such a strong bond as well. So I'd love to see see when that happens. Yeah, well, I totally agree with that. Um, <laughs> in, incidentally, I, I cut the cords for both of my children. Um, and weirdly, uh, like, checked the placentas, um, because that's what midwives do. And uh, yeah, you know, just to make sure that there's no internal bleeding or any ruptures or any big mm-hmm. missing pieces from from the uh, from from the placenta. So um I was very involved in my uh, children's yeah. children's. And I think that's and, more. And, 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 and that's our experience. You know, that's yeah. a that's a good shared experience. And I didn't do it for any other reason than, um, you know, I wanted my children to be as happy and as healthy and as, you know, stable as possible. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's yeah, and it's I such want. an exciting time. And so I, I yeah. love to see fathers being in there everywhere they can. Mm. and and participating and and i think that's healthy and you know back in you know back in the day that wasn't really typical the fathers weren't involved in that and sometimes you know there was times where they weren't even allowed in the room yeah so they were removed from it now we're in a different age where they they need to be part of it yeah which is a little bit ironic really you know uh, the, the the push for fathers being more involved to be more compassionate to be more more sensitive or what have you. What I would say is that um, uh, the argument isn't necessarily that um, men shouldn't be as 
entitled to the children. Um, it's that they should be equally entitled to the children. I'm sure you'll agree with that. Um, yep. And 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 I don't think there's a man out there that would that would sort of um, throw weights or measurements at the importance of carrying a child. Let's say you know and and um, uh, but whether that supersedes a man being in his child's life, um, I don't I don't think that would ever that no, would ever factor. it shouldn't be. Mm -mm. No, it shouldn't be. And I think that that's where some of, um, as moms, we have to, we have to say, okay, that is not okay to say, I own this child because it came from my body. That does not give them the right to say that because you had to have equal parts of the father. Now, literally, literally equal parts of the father to even have the opportunity to have the child, the child, only half of the child came from you. Mm. Literally yeah. the other half yeah. came from the father. So as far as belonging, you know, there is no ownership of the child. There is guidance. Yeah. You are there as a, um, as, as a role model, as someone that guides the child, but the child owns their life, yeah. even when they're small. You just have to guide them into being the best adult that they could possibly be. And that's mm -hmm. the goal of a parent, not over who owns them and what they need to believe or, you know, they're going to have their own mind someday. And yeah, someday absolutely. they may decide that what you did, they don't approve of, and it may backfire on you. Yeah. It may yeah. not have the relationship you think you have because they found out it was based on lies. Yeah. So it's very dangerous game you're playing. Yeah, it's a yeah. very dangerous game. No, I totally, I totally agree. So let's go back. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to Colorado, um, if, if, if that's okay with you. So Absolutely. you're now integrated into this new regime, this new system. Um, how's that? How's that working out for you? How, how are things like, um, you know, uh, you're moving into your sort of uh, early adolescence. So you're sort of you're 10, you're 12 years old. Mm -hmm. What's, what's going on in your life around that, around that sort of age? Well, I have, I, like I mentioned, I have this stepsister who hates me and wants to get rid of me at any means necessary. And I felt like I never understood why my mom bothered to come and get me because I didn't feel like I was in a circle of love or I was in a thriving environment. And when I was being abused and threatened within an inch of my life, nothing ever happened. There was no justice for me whatsoever. So justice is a key word here, but I was never vindicated. I was never protected like I should have been protected. Neither one of my, my not my mom or my new stepfather, new daddy ever protected me from what I refer to as my demon. And I have reasons to call her my demon because I could see her literally change before my eyes. And I recognized it. I knew when it was, when the things, things were about to go down and yeah. I was in big trouble. So, um, the last time, um, she, you know, she's attacked me from behind. She's grabbed my, she sat on top of me, pinned my arms down, you know, along the side of my body with her legs. And she's grabbed, she's got my hair wrapped in her hands by my ears and just shoving my head into the ground over and over again. And, you know, so that was throughout the, the eight year period. But the last time that she ever did anything with me was, and, and I, I did some stuff that I, I have no idea why I did it, but she had a very light complexion and she always burned she never really was able to get a suntan because she was strawberry blonde and very fair skinned. Mm -hmm. So it's her senior year. She's getting ready to take her finals and she's outside. She's setting up a lawn chair and she's got her books there and she's going to sit out in the sun and study for her finals. And I thought, well, that's pretty funny. You're just going to burn. And I'm at the sliding glass door in the back of the house and I just lock it. Don't, I have no idea what come over me because I know better. You don't mess with a person like her. There is no fun and games with a person like her. But all of a sudden I felt like locking her out of the house 
as a joke, I would have never left it locked. Mm. When she came up to the glass, it was like the alien creature that came up and was breathing right in front of Sigourney Weaver. That's what I felt like. Like she was <laughs> at that glass and she was about to attack me. And it freaked me out. And I knew all of a sudden that I had just made a very bad mistake. <laughs> and she comes around to the front of the house and she is breaking in the entire front door. It was a solid oak door and oak frame. And she literally took door and all frame and laid it in. She The whole frame, not just the door, the whole frame, boom, into the house. <laughs> she was pissed. She was, oh, Yeah. And I'm running out into the garage. I don't mean to laugh, but this sounds hilarious. Like, <laughs> well, you think it was like a, a door. It's like, man, the whole door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I get on my bike. I'm in the garage and I can hear her coming. And so I take my bike and I go out and I'm going to, I'm trying to make a break for it because I'm dead. Mm. I'm dead if I stay in that house. Well, she must have realized what I was doing because she went back out the front door and caught me at the corner of the house. And she lifted me up off of my bike by my neck. Oh, my God. Pulled me up off the bike, and she was crushing my throat. And luckily, I had my pinky caught up in there, so I had to spring pinky afterwards. But I don't know if that helped. But what I remember is her face was not her normal face, and I actually have pictures that I just found recently that almost knocked me off my chair when I saw it. But I, there's a picture of her in this dismorphed face. And all I saw as the light was going out was it was just closing in and it was just those demon eyes as the lights went out for me. And I had already expanded my last breath and it was done. It was over at that point, except our parents just pulled into the driveway at this particular moment. And when that, when she snapped out of that, she dropped me. And when she dropped me, the impact made me gasp for that last life-saving breath of air. Jeez. So I heard, and there's a couple other instances in the past where I was um, thinking about not wanting to exist. Mm -hmm. And that voice came to me and said, you're going to be needed someday. That same voice came to me that day too. And it said, get up and run. Mm. So I had, I don't know how, all I can remember seeing is grass. Mm. And I was just struggling to get my balance and get away. So I, I managed to get away and I went and hid at a neighbor's house. And I was petrified. I mean, she, she just tried to kill me. Mm. So they finally coaxed me into coming home and they sat they sat us down at the table. So now I'm sitting at the table with this demon that just tried to kill me side by side. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking she's going to get it. Right. And they handed us a piece of paper each and a piece and a pencil. And my stepfather says, I don't want to hear a word. Just write it. And he walked out of the room and I'm like, you saw what happened, according to what I had just told, because I didn't see them pull up. But I heard mm. they they were already talking about this as I was. They were trying to get me to come home. Yeah. And I'm like, and you want me to write it? First of all, I have a sprained pinky. Mm. I can't write because my hand hurts. Yeah. <laughs> so I was I was so angry. So this is just she was yet getting another away with it. injustice, another, just mm -hmm. another one of those things. So you've had she got away with it. Bits. Yep, he was out there fixing the front door for her that she knocked in, and he was putting the door back together. <laughs> and that was that was it. She didn't get punished. She no, nothing happened. The, there was no police report. There was nothing. I was there just to fend for myself once again. So, yeah, I, I, at this point, I just didn't think my life had value. Obviously, it didn't matter, and it definitely didn't seem like it had any value. Yeah. So there was times after this that that's the mentality that I had, that I'm, I really have no purpose. And going to church, 
they would say, oh yeah, you need to find your purpose. You're going to go out there and live your purpose. And, and I'm like, what is my purpose? My purpose here is being bullied and tortured and, you know, nearly killed for over the last eight years. And so we moved back to California at this point, she went off to college and I'm thinking, I am finally free, finally free. I still have a mom that doesn't really engage or connect or, you know, she's not nurturing. Mm -hmm. And Larry was never home. No one's trying to kill you. Yeah. The um, stepdad was never home. He um, was a pilot and often flying. And so he'd be gone three weeks to however many weeks, uh, months sometimes, depending on where he was flying. So he was rarely home. And, but we moved to California because he had another job opportunity. So um, this was my eighth grade year and um, it wasn't when I got into high school, ninth grade, I started meeting new friends. They were friends at church and then we were going to the same high school. So we were friends in high school as well. And I started telling my story. I started talking about what I had just went through. I started telling them I was, I was abducted when I was a child mm. and they're like, no, no, you weren't. That's crazy. They're looking at this perfect family image, a photo yeah. of the perfect family. You know, they they see my mom and her husband and they think, oh, my gosh, everybody thought they were the perfect couple and that we were just the happiest family. And I'm thinking, no, we've never really been that. Never. I've never, wow. ever experienced that. So the more I shared with them what happened to me, I started getting bullied again. And they were also vicious and they also threatened to kick my butt or, you know, it was, it was almost as traumatic because these were supposedly my friends. Yeah. You've chosen these people yeah. to interact with and share And they with. didn't believe me. They refused to believe me. My, any adults that were in, involved, like from church, they didn't believe me. And these, these girls um, bullied me to the point where it was very traumatic. They ganged up on me about it. And they also influenced their parents at church, which also created this reputation that I had, that I was just a troublemaker and I lied a lot. So mm. I'm now being labeled someone that can't be trusted, someone that doesn't know what, you know, what she's saying. Nobody really dove in to try and help understand what I was trying to say. And as children, we don't know how to communicate very well. Mm. So we, we know we feel something, but we're not exactly sure what it is that we feel. We don't know how to express it. So here's that example of I'm trying to share my life, you know, my experiences with people who've had a near perfect childhood. Yeah. Like in my eyes, it's like pristine. Perfect. I would love mm. to have had a childhood where both parents were there and everybody was love and, you know, having fun, singing, da dancing, laughing. We, I didn't really feel like I had that. So finding a purpose at this point was where I, I stood at a counter one day and, um, there was a knife on the counter and I remember thinking, what do it feel like to just not exist anymore? And I didn't have thoughts of actually using the knife but it was I would just like to not exist and I stood there in silence and like the room was dark or like my eyes were closed or something and that's when I heard that voice that says you're going to be needed someday mm. it was a very familiar voice because I'd heard it before the one that told me to get up and run it told me you're going to be needed someday and that filled me with hope and that hope is what kept me going and it got it hope kept me alive it kept yeah. me here and i heard it one other time when i was still struggling with relationships i was a little older and i i had a souped up gt mustang and i was taught how to drive it by race car drivers i was a trophy girl i was out having fun but the relationship was falling apart and i was struggling to figure out where am i going what am i doing why am i here all these questions started coming back again and not knowing how to fix what was wrong or what was broken, it was easy just to like, I guess it's time to leave again. And as I'm driving to work one day, I'm passing all these trees and I'm driving 140 miles an hour on the back roads. Hmm. And there was a train that I needed to beat 
because the train crosses my road seven times. And if I miss, if I get stuck by the train at one intersection, I will be stopped at every single one of those other intersections and I'd be late for work. So I had to drive fast enough to beat the train. And as I'm driving, I'm watching these trees just flying by me. They're just like mm. boom, 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 boom. And I'm thinking, which one would I hit? Because it would be really easy right now. Which one would I hit? And it's, that voice came again. And it said, you're, you're still going to be needed. It's not time. So again, that hope comes back. And I'm thinking, I have a purpose. There's something out here for me. I just need to find it. I need to figure it out. What's my purpose? So again, hope kept me alive. And I, I left that situation and, you know, moved forward. I ended up moving back to Florida and eventually got married, had children. And that relationship starts falling apart because again, I still don't know how to deal with conflict. I still don't know how to have a meaningful relationship. And one of the things that my stepfather told me on, on my wedding day that I, it still blows me away to this day. Like how, how could you give someone such horrible advice? And especially someone like me who I don't know how to have a relationship with myself or understand myself, mm. be confident with myself. And then you tell me something like this. So he tells me, whatever you do, you need to always protect his ego. His ego is, you know, egos, men are fragile and you need to protect that. Always be there for him. Right. And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, what the heck is that? And now I'm walking on eggshells in my marriage because I don't understand what he meant. I don't understand why do I need to protect him exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know how to protect myself. So I just spent the last 20 some odd years not knowing how to protect myself. Yeah. And I got to protect him. And, and this guy who's ripped you away from your father is telling you this sort of like bizarre advice that he should actually be having a chat with this guy. You know, if you want to talk about egos, you know, hello, stepdad, step up, go yeah. and talk to my new husband. Tell him you know, give, to protect give him, me. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm trying so hard to live up to this and I, I'm thinking I want to stay and I end up having my second child. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to have another child with him. It's not that I didn't want the child. I don't want to have a child with him. I already had one with him. I was already a stepmom to his daughter. I became a mom overnight. The minute we decided to be together, I was instantly his mom. And this was by design. I was selected because I was definitely not his type. Mm. I was selected, though, because I had, um, I guess, characteristics that he thought would be beneficial to step in and be his, a daughter to his mom. Or, I mean, a mom to his daughter. So he saw so the, that a, was a vulnerability in you. A vulnerability. So I had my second child and I'm thinking, I, I'm just getting more and more depressed at this point. And we've been together for quite a while now and I'm not happy at all. And I'm solely responsible for these children, even while married, because he didn't do diapers. He didn't do babysitting. And this is, these are his words. He changed his daughter's diapers, but he would never change his son's diapers. And I thought, Okay, I'm. I think that's weird, <laughs> and yeah. I, you know, again, I don't know enough to, at this point to to really come out and question him. And oh my gosh, heaven forbid I do, because I'm not used to that. I'm not used to speaking my mind or using my voice and telling him you're crazy, man. <laughs> What's, what the heck is wrong with you? Yeah. I, none of that ever came out, and I I would have reactions, but those were reactions. Those were not responses. Those were not this is what I stand for. These are my values. And why are you doing this? Mm. It was, you know, whatever it took to not make him angry. And that yeah. was how my so, marriage was. So were the words echoing through there when you, when you came across these instances, when you wanted to sort of scream, yes. uh, you know, was your fault, was your stepdad's words echoing, like protect his ego and, you know, was that ever, did that suppress you? Did that push you down? I felt, yeah, because I felt set up to fail. I felt like I was not 
I didn't understand what my role was in mm. as being a wife or um, what what I was supposed to do. And, you know, being raised in the church that I was raised in, it was very um, it's very patriarchal, which I think a lot of re religions are. That's why I'm not very religious. I'm very spiritual. I have my own connection, but it, it has nothing to do with religion. Mm -hmm. And that whole method or that whole, um, what is the word I'm looking for? It just by Ideology. design. Yeah, the, the whole thing is like it's designed for the men in that situation. And that's kind of what he was teaching me, that I needed to do everything that I was supposed to do for my husband. Mm -hmm. And it, it really had set me up to fail because it, it didn't protect me and it didn't give me a voice and it didn't make me um, build my confidence whatsoever. Yeah. And again, here I have no value and my life really has no value still. And I'm still thinking, what the heck, you know? So I'm in this severe state of depression and I'm a functioning depression or, you know, depressed person where, um, I decide, okay, I, I need to get a job because we were living not even paycheck to paycheck. We were under, we were always in the red and, we couldn't even pay the electric bill. So he would run an extension cord to our neighbor's garage and kind of steal his electricity to keep our refrigerator on. Oh, wow. So I was like, it this was is bad. not, yeah, this is, I don't want to raise my kids like this. Mm. I don't want them to think this is okay. So parts of me at least knew instinctively, this isn't good. And I don't want my kids to, I don't want my kids to grow up like this. I want my kids to thrive. Mm. I want them to have the life I never had. And I see it out there. I've seen it in all my friends, even the ones that bullied me, even the ones that, you know, attacked me quite often. I don't want my kids to have this life. Mm. And I don't want them to think that it's okay for them to treat their wives like this. And I started thinking about if going forward, are they going to turn into him? And I don't want them to turn into him. I don't want, and, and not that I don't want them to be connected to their father. I just didn't want them having a relationship that was emulating what we had. Mm. So I decided I needed to leave, but you know, getting, getting the job and stuff like that, I, I couldn't support myself. So I went and I started working for Home Depot because that was the only way I could even afford to go to work without paying someone else yeah. to watch the kids. Cause again, he doesn't babysit. So we came to an agreement though, that if I went to work late enough and I got the kids in bed, then yeah, I could go to work that right. he would be okay staying home with them if they were already in bed because <laughs> he didn't do that either. Okay. So I, I was at work, I worked nights at home Depot, pre labor field type job. And mm. I was exhausted when I came home, but I had to get up and, you know, I had to stay up long enough to get my stepdaughter to school. Yeah. And I had to take care of all of the, you know, all the kids stuff in the morning. So I didn't get to like come home and just go to bed and sleep the day. Yeah. Yeah. I had to come home and take care of the kids still. So one day, one night I called to check on the kids just to see how things were going. And he was a, a drunk, which was a very common occurrence. He was drunk quite often. And he told me I left, I left the kids over at so-and-so's house. And I'm like, you left them over with some guy that were all, hearing that he is a pedophile oh. and you left my kids there. <laughs> so I quit my job on the spot and I went to pick up my kids. Mm. And when I got there, what I saw on the screen and my stepdaughter was awake, she had just sat up and looked at the screen and I was mortified with what she had seen. And she asked questions about that later. And I was like, this, this, I can't, I can't keep doing this. Yeah. There's, there's no parental value. We don't even have the same um, types of parenting styles. We had mm. no connect. I didn't even ask the question before I got married. <laughs> and that's an important thing too, is being able to make sure that you are compatible. We were totally not compatible. So I finally told him, you need to stop drinking and I'm going to Colorado moving back in with my mom and dad. I'm taking the boys, but I'm going to go to school so that I can get a good job because I'm used to having good jobs. I mean, you know, I had good paying jobs where I could afford a Mustang GT. I was, mm. you know, 
pretty self independent. I was independent, but now I'm like not even. I'm living below poverty at this point, and yeah. you know we're we're stealing from our neighbor to keep our fridge turned on. Uh, that's that's like unacceptable. Yeah. yeah. So I told him you need to stop drinking beer every day, and the next day he comes home with Captain Morgan and Coke. So I'm pretty sure that that's my message. That was the answer. And so yeah. I, I moved to back to Colorado. So now I'm back at mom and dad's house. And, you <laughs> back know, into I, the layer. Yeah, back into it. And I was still depressed. And, you know, I was going to school now. I was starting to get a job right out of school. I start, things were starting to work out, but I'm still depressed. So I went to a, a therapist and um, he, it was... I forget which one can actually write the prescription psychotherapist. Oh yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. So I went to him and, um, he, he heard about my marriage and he heard about some of some of my child, cause I never talked to him about any of the other stuff, but he says, well, as a mom, I see that you're setting goals, you're making plans, you're getting your children what they need and you're protecting them. He's like, I don't have any problems with what you're, what you're doing. He's like, but you have too many toxic people in your life and you need to get rid of them. And of course, he named my husband and it's like, you need to cut off the communication as much as possible. Only focus on what you need to the conversations that need to happen and nothing else. That's it. You do not need to talk to him. You can let the kids talk to him, but you do not need to talk to him. I'm like, OK, I can live with that. Now someone's telling me what I need to do and I can follow those directions. Yeah. And then he says, secondly, and he starts writing on this prescription pad and he writes, move out of your mother's house. He says, she's toxic. Wow. You need to get away from her. And so at that point I thought, holy cow, this must be really bad for someone to actually write me a prescription yeah. to move away from my mother. And at that point I started thinking I can be totally independent I can, and he, he kind of gave me that nudge that I yeah, needed. What a, what a great vindication for him to recognize what was going on with your mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally validated. Mm. So I um, started doing some work and started, you know, getting into the job, actually making friends and did a little bit of dating, but I, you know, I, I kind of ran into guys that were, you know, either, you know, it was match.com in the beginning and like, okay, that so was not you. <laughs> 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 I had some really interesting guys there. Um, and then I dated somebody that ended up being very abusive and I, I didn't even realize the situation I was in and ended up moving back down to Florida for five months. And we lived in this Tarpon Springs area and what was interesting is at this particular time, this was in 2001, 2002, and mm -hmm. I just left in 19, or 2000, January 1st, 2000 is when I left my husband. So I'm back shortly after, and I'm living in Tarpon Springs. What's ironic is that so did my dad. My real father was living in Tarpon Springs at the same time. Now, Tarpon Springs is a small town in Florida. Wow. And we had to have crossed each other, passed each other on the road. We probably maybe passed each other in the grocery stores, but we were around each other for Was five he in your mind months. at that point as well? Huh? Like, what? Because there must have been a point where you've gone, like, I, I, I just give up. You know, I give up mm. with my with my dad or what have you. You know, and 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 you go through year after year after year of normality, etc. So how did that? That's How a that good question because even course. back to when I was um, in the home as, at the age of four to 12, when I was, and I kept wanting him to come and rescue me. Mm -hmm. I constantly thought about him. Why aren't you coming around? Why can't you come and see what's going on here? I need, come and get me, take me away from this hell. So I had those thoughts when I was really young. And then as an adult, I thought, I'm going to find my dad. I'm going to go and find him because I don't remember the person that my mom paints. Mm. I wasn't allowed to talk about him. She forced me to call her husband, daddy. If I did talk about him, she'd tell me something horrific that he was this horrible person that people wanted to kill to scare me from wanting to be around him. 
And at some point I was thinking, you know, he hasn't bothered to come. And so I asked her, did you, did he ever send me birthday cards or call me or Christmas? She's like, no, no, he doesn't do anything like that. He, he just stopped engaging altogether. He doesn't care. So I started believing if he doesn't care about me, that's why mm-hmm. he's not bothering to come. So I would have the ups and downs where I would think that, and then I would think, but that's not who I remember. So I would mm-hmm. try really hard to not think that way, but then couldn't help it because there's no action. Yeah, I have nothing to compare it to besides the fact that he's not there and he hasn't tried to find me yeah. according to what I see. So as an adult, I thought I need to find him. I need to find him. And um, when I was real little, before my mom even left, they were working for Sammy Davis Jr. They were, All right. yeah, they were doing work with him. They were actually making some films, some videos with him. Um, uh, and that was stuff that uh, they were doing that I think that's partly what my mom was trying to conceal and from her new husband. So that's why this whole story about how he's this horrible person came into play because she doesn't know that I know about that world. And I actually have photos. I have the images. I have negatives. I have all of these pictures of this. And I would send her a picture and say, look at this. You look so pretty. And she'll say, oh, is that me? And I'm like, come on. You know that's you. <laughs> but okay, she, well, like, so, so, right, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to follow that, that, that little snippet there. So she was working in cut in Hollywood mm-hmm. on films with people like Sammy Davis Jr. while she was with your husband? With oh, sorry, her sorry, husband. Sorry. While, while My she father. Was your father. Yeah. Right. So the two of them worked for Sammy Davis Jr. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they did other things like my dad would, um, he was in charge of Sammy's guns because he used all his own guns in all of his Western films. Right. So they had to, they had to like carry these guns, you know, to and from the set. And my dad was the only person allowed to touch them. Right. He trusted him to, to ma- manage the gun, the vault and all that. Mm-hmm. So they did that, but they also were involved in shooting some of these films. And So um, why didn't she want to be associated with that? Why was that a problem with her new husband? Because they were a little promiscuous. Uh-huh. Right. So they they were they um they call it today they call it like soft porn which is on TV it's mm-hmm. not like porn full blown porn but it's today we see what used to be rated R is you know cuz it's considered that so it's not right. like the dirty side of that or the um that that side of it but i think she still has some either maybe she regrets doing it i don't know but she became this religious person, so now it's even more detrimental to conceal that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it, she's from just what pushed I can, that way down. Yeah. Like, and honestly, I never saw anything that was, like, way out there as far as her or him. I saw some others, but it wasn't them, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Think, yeah. thankfully. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's just a side that she's trying to conceal, and she doesn't right. want anybody to know about it. And right. I think that's why she has this the story that she's created and had me believing had her husband believing everybody's believing this story because she really doesn't want anybody to know about this. Right. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're in the same town as your dad. I'm in the same um, town. And you've run away effectively from that, from, from from that town, from, from, from the husband that you had at that point. Okay, uh, yeah. So let me let me clarify that. So I had left my husband mm-hmm. in January first of two thousand. We were still going through a divorce. So when I moved to Tarpon Springs with a fiance, I'm still trying to get a divorce. Right. And I came down here because this is Florida had the jurisdiction, and being here kind of helped me talk face to face with my attorney. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime this fiance had essentially isolated me from everybody and I didn't even see it happening. Right. It just totally didn't see it happening. And then I was late coming home one day cause I was going to pick up furniture that someone was giving us for free. And I, Florida has some really congested 
um, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can understand really bad traffic that could take you hours just to go 30 miles. Mm -hmm. So I'm stuck in traffic and I can't get home. And he had called me earlier that day and wanted me to be home by, by eight o'clock. I'm like, well, it's 19. I can't, I can't, you know, if it's traffic jammed, I can't, there's nothing I can do about that. So I was 15 minutes late. Mm -hmm. And when I got home, he, he was visually angry and took off in my car and left. So I'm unloading this free furniture with my friend by ourselves now so that she can take her truck back. And then I still have to go get my car because that was, you know, we left the car down there just to have the truck. So, um, he comes back not long after that and he was, he, he gets a little violent and mm -hmm. he starts throwing dresser drawers at me. He bursted a blood vessel in my arm from grasping me. And this is the first experience I've ever had with um, a male having this kind of abuse towards me. Yeah. And it totally threw me off. The police shows up. There's this whole report. My kids witnessed all of it. And I thought, oh, gosh, I can't. I can't do this either. I can't have my kids witnessing that at all. So mm. now I'm looking to leave, not realizing my father was still living in the same place. So when I left in 2000, still in Starbucks Springs, and I was just living 20, 30 miles south. Of I may not have gone to Florida. I mean, to Colorado. I may have stayed in Florida to get to know him. Had you have known I, if you were, yeah. Had I known, if I would have been looking, I had kind of thought about it. And maybe, maybe that's why I thought about it because maybe I sensed him. Mm. And so my ex-husband knows about this whole thing about me trying to find my dad. He knew all that. And so when, maybe when I was having the moments of wanting to find him, I was sensing him as being close because right. he was literally that close. So I moved so away. And then I moved I, back and I'm still close to him. Yeah. So I take it that you've um, never had his address or anything like as simplistic as that to kind of like, go, oh, I'll go, I'll go and. No. Like, did, did he move from well, had, apartments and things at some point? Because you said did, he stuck did, did around he uh, the apartments that he was living in. Uh, okay. When yeah, you were so a child. let me give you a little bit of a insight on him but mm. after, after the abduction. He lived in that apartment um, for a while after that. He had met his wife, who is, you know, his wife now, shortly after I was I was taken. Mm -hmm. And he, he was not interested in having any other children at all. He was like, nope, I'm done. He had just lost his daughter. But if you think about his own childhood, he lost his mother when he was only 14 years old. And he never met his father. So he was parentless at 14 mm. and, you know, he aged out at 18 and that's when he went down to Florida and, and met my mom and, you know, then we go from there. So at this point, he's like, I've lost the two most important women in my life. Three, actually, if you want to count my mom, because he was just, he was really in love with my mom. Sure. So three women now have, he's lost them and he's not interested in going through that pain ever again. So mm. as far as he's concerned, we're just going to have fun and we're not having any kids. And it took her 12 years to get him to realize that she's not going anywhere. And then they decided to start having a family. So I have three half brothers right. from, from them that they were raised knowing who I was. Yeah. And as they grew up, they started looking for me. They started to try and help him find me but they didn't know what my name was anymore. So it was almost impossible. And there's with an adoption illegal, if, if bet, at best, they still were not able to uncover that name. So they, uh, they weren't able to, but I became a private investigator and started using those resources so that I could hopefully find him. Right. And I'm going to pause for just a second. Cause I think my screen's paused. Can okay. you see me? Uh, yes, it, it has been it has been scuffling out, but I've been been able to uh, get the get the gist of what you were saying. Okay, there you're back now too. So, okay, so now um, where was I? 
Uh, so you I were saying I got that distracted you, you, watching the screen. Yes. Um, so, so, so you became a private oh. detective essentially, and uh, you use those resources. Yeah. yeah. There is a little bit. Of I a wanted delay. to figure out how to find somebody. Yeah, it is. It's kind of pixelating too. Let me give okay. it a second. Sure. One hour. Should I try it now? Yeah, go for it. It's okay. So I, I wanted to use the resources and learn how to find somebody. So I started digging in on being being a private investigator and I had found um found him a couple of times and sent an uh sent something, but it would never, you know, I'd never get anything back. And then finally in 2008, my mom finally gave me his birthday. So the only thing I ever had with him was, um, his name and a picture and my birth certificate. That's it. And it just mm. said that he was 21 years old when I was born. So I knew approximately his birth date, but I didn't have an exact. And if you look up Patrick Charles McCarty, there are so many Patrick McCartys in this world, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And I've talked to about 20 or 30 of them. You know, some of them were too old. Some of them were too young. <laughs> some of them lived in different countries. I'm like, oh, this is like a needle in a haystack. And so I, I found um, in some of my research, I found somebody that fit the age range with the birth date that she had just given me. Right. And he was in California. So all of these things started lining up and I found a marriage license and it had somebody's name on it. And I thought, okay, so maybe that's his new wife. So I sent a uh, birthday card because now I know his birthday. And so I sent him a birthday card and told him, you know, I'm looking for my bi biological father and that has led me, my search has led me to you. You know, I'm sorry if this is an imposition, but I'd really like to get some information about family history. So I kind of left it very casual and it came back as, um, no longer at this address, which means he was there. Yeah. He just, I just missed him. So I, I kind of had a little hope at that point that I'm on, I'm on to something here. Yeah. But then, you know, you work really hard, you work really hard and then you kind of give up again. Like it's fruitless. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how, how old were moments. you when you were doing that? How, how old were you when you were that doing that? That was in 2008 after I did my final on the human trafficking and found out that, you know, found the people that were just like me. Right. So I'm starting to clue in on what's been going on. And so now I'm re-energized to find him again. Yeah. And, you know, so I did it for another, probably another year or so. I, I really dug in and tried to, to, to find him. Mm -hmm. And then I'd, I'd be worn out. And I'd stop for a little while. Yeah. And then in 2016, I, um, now, now my kids were not allowed to have their own social media accounts growing up, you know, criminal justice, cybersecurity. Yeah, no, not happening. <laughs> right. So they didn't have the exposure early on. And it wasn't until they became adults that we all decided to go ahead and get Facebook accounts. And I started looking up Patrick McCarty's on Facebook and I'm thinking, I don't know why I didn't think about this before, is I never thought about as you know everything I heard about Facebook was like, eh. Um, so I start looking up um, Patrick McCarty's, and I find oh, so many of them, but there was one that had a dog for a profile picture, and I just felt like I needed to see that person, like so I'd go through and I'd look at all the photos. I'm like, this could this could possibly be the guy because mm. he kind of looks like the older version of this one photo that I had. This could be him. So I sent him messages, but because we're not friends, you yeah. know, it goes into that, that hidden inbox yeah. that you don't see all the time. So he never saw it. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this can't, I can't give up on this. So yeah. I started going through his friends and I noticed that the same person on that marriage license that I had just found, or, you know, back in 2008. So now mm -hmm. it's 2020, uh, December of 2015. Yeah. And rolling right into January, I found her name on his friends list. And I'm like, this has got to be him. This has got to be him. So I started going through their friends list, and there's no way I was going to reach out to her. I didn't yeah. want to, like, 
shock her because I don't know what she know, knows at this point. So I start digging and I found a son, or I found a name on there that had both of them on his friends list that was the same, the age that could be a, one of their children. And his name was there. So I reached out to him and I told him, I, my name is Don and I'm looking for my biological father and I'm trying to find out more information about family history, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, I have a sister named Don, but we haven't seen her in a while. And I'm like, well, because I was abducted. And he goes, yeah, that's the story I was told. And I'm like, no way. And I'm almost in disbelief. Yeah. And I'm just kind of staring at the screen and I'm calling for my son. I'm like, get in here. And I said, read this to me because I want to make sure I actually read that right. And he's like, yeah, I think you just found your, who is this guy? I'm like, I don't know, but he's friends with this guy. And I think that guy is my father. And so we're like, is, so maybe he's, is he my brother? Possibly. So I said, would, would he be interested in speaking to me? So within five minutes, I had his phone number and I heard his voice for the first time in 44 years. Uh, he just, it was that fast. That connection fantastic. was, was the connection. So then all of a sudden I had this family. I have three brothers, a niece and stepmom. And she had saved one of my baby photos and she actually put it in their family Bible so that they would always know where it was because she always felt that we would find each other. Yeah. So she grabbed that picture. They took a picture of it and they texted it to me. And that just was like, whoa, things just became real. I had never seen a picture of myself before the age of four. Because when I was gone, we didn't take any pictures. So I never knew what I looked like as a baby. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. So when I was getting my, um, doing the thesis and I met that group of other people um, that were also abducted, and we were yeah. part of that study. That's where the missing poster comes in. That we all had to get our missing posters and hold them up. And I had to make mine up. There was a couple ladies there that we mm -hmm. had to make ours up because we didn't have that. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't have a picture of myself to use. So I had to find one online. And I found one that I thought, okay, well, that looks like something I might have looked like. So I, I used that. And when you, and you can see it on my profile on Facebook now, when you've I've seen it, I've commented. Yeah. On it. It's like, wow, that was pretty dang close. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that's the whole missing poster piece of it. But I just think that's so like mind blowing. I mean, what must have happened when you you've you've read this message back and it's like yeah that's like what we're told right my sister was a yeah. my sister was abducted yeah so when i started seeing the pictures it started really sinking in like this is it and i thought we we're on the phone together and we're like total disbelief you can imagine like what do you what do you say and i'm like the only thing i could say was hey and that's all I can muster. And in fact, I have a video about that. I don't know if you've seen the video that I, nice. I created last year. And it's with the song, the music, and it's called Hey, actually. And it is about a, a father-daughter finding, finding each other again. So it's kind of ironic that the song fits my life. Yeah. So yeah. I got permission from the artists to use the song as the video um, so I'll, you'll have to watch that later well, too. Was, I mean, send me the link and we'll, we'll, we'll put it on here. Put it on oh here. yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, it's actually bit.ly forward slash just said, Hey, right. I'll get you. All right. I'll send you. Yeah. 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 Send, sure. send it over. Send it over. So, um, i we're both sitting there like, well, how do we know this is it? It's like, we both know that this has got to be it, but how do we know for sure? Because, you know, most people want a DNA test. They want to prove yeah. that, you know, you're part of the family. And I'm like, I don't need a DNA test. I just need you to answer one question because only my biological father would know the answer to this question. And he goes, okay, what's that? I said, which celebrity did we hang around with when I was two? And he goes, oh, you mean Sammy? And I'm like, that's the one. And that's why I told the story about Sammy, because that that was very significant mm. in me establishing the fact that I truly found my biological father. 
And I always knew that Sammy would help me find him. I just didn't know that's how he would help me find him. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, full circle. All these little p- bits and pieces that may not make sense in the beginning, they, you know, when I start tying them together, mm. they mm. all have a, a significant part in that reunification. And now we knew 100%, no DNA test needed, yeah. that we finally found each other. And we, we started to heal and grow. And he was sharing you know, what he went through. I was sharing what I went through. Of course, what I went through really hurt him. It was really hard for him to mm. hear this and to listen to this because he was against it, all of it. He never gave up his parental rights. They were just taken and he didn't even know it. They never contacted him. Yeah. So the adoption was granted because of an affidavit that my mom completed that kind of fudged the details that mm-hmm. weren't true. And the state of Oregon, because that's where we were living at the time when he adopted, when my stepdad adopted me, they didn't follow their own state statute and investigate. They were required by their own law to investigate for 60 days before they allowed this adoption. Had they done their job, had they followed their own laws and their own, you know, their own criteria, yeah. I would have been reunited with my father at the age of eight. The age of eight. So the state Failed. let me down. Mm. And I hold them equally responsible for this whole catastrophe yeah 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 that that's it firmly lays at their doorstep um mm-hmm. from, from from what you said and if they're if they're not going to do their due diligence and what have you then yeah yeah you're gonna you're gonna and and this is why i don't believe do yeah this is why i don't believe in accusations being taken and that's what our family courts do is they take an accusation and they decide if they believe it or not believe it, and they make mm. rulings against it. I will stand up every single time and disagree with how they do that because that what's, that's what happened to me, and I lost my father because of that decision. They didn't make sure she was right. They yeah. just took yeah. her word because what she had was somebody that was willing to step up. Mm. But what they're not thinking about is I don't give a crap about what the state thinks a father is. I'm the child and I know who my father was. I don't need the state telling me who they're going to assign Mm. as my father. It's not up to them. They don't get to make that call. What they're doing is replacing parents that should never be replaced. And that is a disgrace when it comes to what the, the trauma and the outcome of the child. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely right. The um, the way government's reaching into families is just so draconian and barbaric. Yeah, I think I think maybe initially they thought that they were helping, but it's gotten to be much more than that. Now, now it's actually an income. Now they make money off of child support. They make money off of families breaking up. So they have no interest in keeping families together. No. And can you see the correlation between what the courts did um, and how and how they acted and how the government acted um, by sort of sidestepping and not quite getting the full story and how your stepdad acted and was sort of manipulated to be a rescuer? for your mother in the same respect. So she's gone to him and said, you know, this is a, my, you know, when he asked, obviously, you know, do you have children or what have you, or, you know, when she came to him and said, I've got a child after they had then sort of got married, which is dubious in itself. The correlation between that and how the courts think what they're doing is helping as well. So he's come out and he's and and he's rescued you in his mind from yeah some sort he of peril. He was totally validated in stealing another man's child. 
based mm. off of what he was told. He felt that he was in the right to steal someone's child. Mm. The courts feel that they are justified in doing the same thing based on what they were told. So mm. they, they take a mother who comes in who's super emotional and maybe, a, um, I don't want to say mother, a parent that's super emotional and maybe a little dysregulated. And I think at times the court system says, well, we don't want to disrupt that. So we're just going to rule this way because they're, they're going to be able to handle it. And so instead of making um, decisions based on what's best for the family, they're making decisions on what they can stay out of. Yeah. And what they can just push through. It's like, okay, we're just going to say this because then that yeah. gets them out of our courtroom. We don't want that. The path and of they, least resistance. Yeah, path of resistance. And they're not, they're not, they're not capable hmm. of understanding the psychological events that are happening. They're not capable of understanding the detrimental um, effects that happen to a child based on their decisions. Hmm. When they make these kinds of decisions, they're thinking it's just today. But for the child, it's the every single day for the rest of their lives that's affected. Yep. And I'm a prime example of it. That decision that that particular court made on that day where they granted and they waived the investigation and they granted the adoption, mm. every single day since that day, they've been involved in my life. Yeah. And I am determined that I'm going to reverse that adoption. And I'm going to replace my father as my legal father because mm. right now I'm still not a member of my own family yeah. right now I am just a relative but not legally I am not legally a sister mm. I am not legally an aunt and I'm not legally my father's daughter because I'm in the eyes of the law they say I'm somebody else's daughter and I just found this out actually in uh, I think it was 2019 when I found out that I knew that there was something that had happened, but I had never seen adoption paperwork. I knew that right. my name was changed. I had a birth record ID card, but not a birth certificate. My mom only gave me my primary birth certificate. So I didn't know that this actually went through the courts. So when I tried to get a copy, someone requested a copy of my birth certificate and they needed a certified copy. Well, I'm not giving them the one and only one I have. So I requested a new one. And they said, well, that's not who you are. I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah, that's that's no longer your identity. I'm like, but I have a birth certificate right here. She's like, that's invalid. And I'm like, what do you mean it's invalid? It's the only birth certificate I've ever had. And she goes, no, you have a different one. Were you adopted? And it was like, click. I'm like, oh, oh, there's a birth certificate for that? And she's like, yeah, whenever you're adopted, you're issued a brand new birth certificate. It's like the other one never existed. Mm. I have a huge problem with that. <laughs> I have a huge <laughs> problem with that. I think that children deserve to know who their biological parents are whenever they want, so long as the biological parent wants to be found as well. Mm. I'm not saying that we should just not consider but they have yeah. the right to know who they came from and not this red tape that our government conceals to protect the adoptive parent we're not well, protecting the child it's just another minefield that's been created isn't yeah. it yeah yeah so minefield. i finally i finally convinced her i'm like look my legal name is and i didn't tell you the the name the the part about my father naming me don andrea mccarty right so i'm telling her my legal name is don andrea mccarty and so whatever you name you have on that birth certificate no longer exists. And I do not recognize that as my legal parent at this point, because now I do not recognize that I was adopted and that I was ever a, a stepdaughter because his family never accepted me. They rejected me 100% would not ex include me as part of the family that I was adopted into. Yeah. So there again, there's more rejection, more um, abandonment more of all that stuff going on there. So she, uh, she's like, well, I understand you changed your name, but until this is reversed, there's nothing we can do about it. So I got her to put on my new birth certificate 
that she has with my real dad. But at the bottom, they have this but clause. She was adopted by so-and-so. And so this this birth certificate cannot be used um, as a valid form of identification. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Oh my wow. Gosh. How so crazy. So what I'm, are you doing I'm, about that now then? I want to, and, and of course COVID hit. So, you know, things kind of like went downhill. Courts weren't open. They're not taking cases. So I haven't been able to do it. I wanted it done last year. So this year I'm going to start it up again where I can do whatever I can to reverse the adoption because I am an adult now and I can say who my father is. I met him. I know him. And that whole, the way that whole adoption was done should have never been done that way. Yeah. So if I can find an attorney that will represent me in Oregon, that's got the, the, uh, the, um, what do I want to say? <laughs> got the well, strength yeah. to stand up to the court and say, you were wrong. <laughs> A conviction <laughs> and help yeah. me reverse it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be amazing. I really hope yeah. that that happens for you because it's a it's a farce. It's farcical for that yeah. to ever be absolutely. The case. How how can your, you know, that's a that's a massive human rights like you know an identity is. It was absolutely. It was my identity, stoner. and that was my biggest struggle throughout my mm -hmm. entire life until I realized in 2016. It wasn't until after I found my father that I realized I had been living in this identity crisis. And that's why I couldn't establish meaningful relationships. And I had struggles in my marriage and I didn't know how to deal with conflict because I was never taught how to be yeah. considered valid or worthy of anything. So it's super important that children have the environment that they can thrive in because that's what makes them the best adult they can possibly be. I had to learn the hard way. I had to come and work through all of this yeah. on my own accord. And I had to come to the, the, to the realization that I needed to do the work. I could have stayed and became a victim, but I was never intended to be a victim. What I was intended. And this, this is ironic that the, um, that we're at this particular point is because like we said in the beginning, I'm a cybersecurity specialist and I've worked in cybersecurity for over 20 years and I have the criminal justice degrees, but my lived experiences gives me um, a unique perspective on what happens. And it's all bridged together. All of these are pillars in what I bring today. So it's all about protecting someone or something, which I've been mm. doing my whole life. I've been constantly trying to protect myself. I've always protected the underdog, the one that was being bullied. I, I stand against bullying in all forms. And here I am now bringing these all together in one package to where I'm helping protect children going forward in this time and in this place. Because my purpose was never about back then. Yeah. That was my conditioning and my ability to bring that forward because I was strong enough to come out of it and have that authority today to speak to parents and to whoever needs to hear how we need to protect children, not just from being abducted as a, as a child, not just from losing a parent, because those are very important, but also how we are parenting in the age of technology. What are we doing to safeguard children so that they are safe at home, so that they're not being in danger. They're not stumbling into these hidden dangers because parents can identify that, but children aren't capable of, yeah. I, um, of understanding the difference between should I trust him or not? You know, is this really, is this a real true person or is this a scam? Children are not equipped with that yet. So parents have to be involved in there. So that's, that's kind of what I'm bringing with all of this tied together. It's almost like a perfect storm at the moment for, you it's know, it's definitely this, an epiphany. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, even with all this sort of, um, uh, family law, um, issues and the way, and the way sort of, you know, families are being pulled apart then to have something like, um, you know, the internet and the technology and the social media being what it is, you know, mm -hmm. it's so rife that there is children and young people out there who are just absolutely in pieces like mentally and what have you over something as 
you know something as 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 easy to incorporate as like a cyber security you know sit down or uh, like a run through or a refresh mm -hmm. or what have you i mean i don't know exactly what you do in regards to cyber security but maybe you'd tell us a bit more about that oh sure so mostly what i've done is i protect data and identities and it's ironic that you know identities is, is something that i everything i do revolves mm. around identity and so working through some of this stuff it's like that was a huge thing so my tagline is you know in cybersecurity they talk about data is the new oil and i throw in the tagline of identity is the new gold and with my company name um it's called securing everything it's literally can it can touch on all these different pillars or ten tentacles of what needs to be secured. So we're not talking about just cybersecurity. We're talking about childhood and how they can be secured. And when children are depressed and feeling isolated or feeling um, anger towards any given situation, what do they do? They go online. They, they reach out to friends on the internet and they're not always making the best choices because they're not really being governed or guided mm -hmm. because they know more than most parents know. So we've kind of flipped the roles where they have more freedom online than yeah. parents realize. And that's a huge um, danger for the child and parents. Uh, and it is cute because I remember, you know, you think back at your kid and they do something so amazing and it's like, oh, that's so cute that they, they did that. Mm. But when you think about how cute it is that you didn't know how to turn, you know, do something on your phone or on your desktop and I had to call and ask my son to fix it for me. I had to get my 14 year old in here to show me how to, to do this, that, or the other thing. It's cute until it's not cute mm. until they're in trouble until they're faced with something that you don't know about because you don't know enough about the technology or yeah. about how social media works to protect them. And that's what I want to do is help parents learn what they need to know so that they're not, um missing out on these these particular areas where children still need to be protected mm. no, that's so it's a, still about protecting yeah that's a that's the definite message i mean i'm i know that i'm in a few sort of arms races with with the teenagers and stuff at the moment you know like uh you know you sort of think oh i know what i'm doing with facebook okay yeah facebook can be quite dangerous and then they go yeah but Facebook nobody uses it anymore, right? It's all about Snapchat and Instagram. And that's a problem. And then they go, you're like, wait, what? Yeah. What, what, and Snapchat? then like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay, right, okay, Snapchat. Well, how do you lock that down? And then you think, well, okay, yeah, you can lock that down. But now it's all about TikTok, right? And then it's all about something else, and there's something else, and there's probably a number of things that yeah I don't even know about. Oh, about the how about the more than three thousand acronyms that your children have access to that helps them have communications that conceals it from you because to you, it looks like gibberish. Yeah. 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 But and, it really means something. And it can be pretty dark things. Pretty dark, pretty dark. Absolutely. So yes. yeah, I mean, and now I know that I have to, I have to legally reverse my adoption in order to be who I am or who I always thought I am. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I 100% identify with who I am. And no court is going to tell me otherwise. And some people say, well, then why bother? Because it's the principle and it's the last tribute I can give to my father, even though he's not here. But I can be my brother's legal sister. Yeah. I can be my niece's legal aunt. You know, to me, that is like me controlling 100% of my identity by taking mm. that back. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an identity it's... thing. It's as important as it was for the authorities to change it in the first place. You know, if it wasn't important for somebody to have that, then, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's totally valid for you to for you to see yeah. the importance to that. And it's not fair if anybody goes, well, why bother? But you should bother. You should absolutely bother about yeah. it. You know, because absolutely. It's, yeah. it's not what you think about it now. It's what's going to turn up in the future as to why it's going to be important. You might not even know now why it's why it's yeah. so relevant. Well, I know that it's easy to live in denial. And I know that for other people out there that are like me, if they're not thinking that it's important, 
there might be a little bit of denial going on because I know there's a spot inside that we all have that yeah. we're protecting, but it's the curiosity. Like, I really want to know, but I'm afraid to ask. Yeah. Or I really want to know, but I'm so angry at this whole situation. I don't think I need to deal with it. Mm. But if you can imagine that I'm full of holes, 50% of me has holes. And those holes are painful and there's nerve endings around the outside edges of all these holes, right? And in order to dull that pain, I have to stuff stuff in there. I have to kind of like pack it. So I'm not feeling that pain. And we grow up packing these holes and it's a paper thin filling that makes it appear like we don't have holes, that we're a whole person until something happens. And you're like, okay, this, this pain is real. And when I found my father, I was able to pull off that paper thin layer and take out that stuffing. And I was able to replace it with the unconditional love that I never realized that he still had for me. So now those holes are really filled with love and, mm. and who I am. I have the answers to all those curiosity questions. I know who my family is now. I did DNA tests and they reached out to me and said, who are you? You know, and I, I now know who my other half of my world is. I was able to go on a family trip, family reunion road trip, and I went and met them. I reunited him with his favorite aunt and cousins that he lost track of before his mother died that he hadn't talked to since then. And he was able to reunite with them before he passed away. So it was, it kind of brought him full circle where he lost all of his family. And then mm. he, he has his you know, wife and sons. And then now he has the rest of us back too. And then he was able to speak to both, to both me and to some of his family members before he left. So that was, yeah. that was huge too. But the healing, you can't imagine the way you feel when you really acknowledge the need to heal that healing. You, you can deny it all you want, but I know it's there and you think it's okay now, but you don't know what it feels like to not just say it's okay to say, I absolutely 100% know I am great that I am whole. And there's no doubt because there's no more concealed holes in me because they've mm -hmm. all been filled up with the, the love that was always needed. That's an amazing analogy. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful analogy of the, of the holes being filled up, etc. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can only, yeah, I can't imagine how, how elated, you know, you, you must feel. I mean, even just sort of sitting opposite the screen to you, I can see that there's like a, um, I mean, I didn't know you before, but I can see that there's like a happiness about yep. you when, when you speak about your father and when you speak about, you know, this, this turning point of your life, which makes me feel that, um, you know, the 44 years that you had estranged from your father um, must have disappeared in the blink of an eye when you when you did yeah. when you did find him. You know, and that's that's funny that you say that because 44 years, and I talk to parents today, and they're like, I can't, I don't have 44 years. I need this now. I get mm. it. That that desperation. That's that's probably how my father felt. He didn't imagine that he needed to wait 44 years either. But I can honestly say now that I understand my purpose better and why I had to go through that childhood to be able to be here today to speak to how I speak to people on not just protecting children emotionally, but protecting them in the cyberspace as well, yeah. because there's more of a need today more than ever. We had a 28% increase in calls to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children in 2020. So wow. There is an increase of what the, of those dangers going on, and people are starting to see it. We need people to continue to see that so that awareness piece comes out. But I can honestly say, and I ha it, it's taken me a long time to get here, but as of this last month, so this is brand new, is the first time I can say that I am actually grateful for my childhood. As bad and as horrible as it sounds, yeah. It's giving me that power and strength to do what needs to be done today. And oh. if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have such, I wouldn't have the impact 
that I need to have right now. So, I mean, that's the best way to look at it, I think. And, you know, my, my father's not here physically, but I feel like he would be sitting right here next to me, helping me build my business, helping me figure out ways to protect children. He would totally be all over this. So that, that is a comfort as well, because I think he is in his own way somehow here. And you can do it in honor of him, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you feel, like you said, you filled, you filled those holes. You, you, you have him now, you know, you have mm -hmm. his identity. You I have... don't have that doubt. The doubt, the doubt is a killer. Mm. That doubt is bad when it comes yeah. to children having doubt. It's a, it's a negative feeling. And as if you are saying that you're okay, but you have doubt about any of it, then you need to you need to have a discovery moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's yeah, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's um, what an amazing insight into um, into your life, into into those those years and that uh, and how it I mean, coming full circle is really the way to describe it, you know, for for you to have that and to and to do what you're doing now and to intertwine it so so um so well with the you know with the security message and the ch and 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 the protection message mm. etc it's really really resonates so it's uh, yeah it really helps to not have all these straggled loose ends where you're thinking okay well that what was the point of that what was the point of that what was the point of that it's nice to be able to tie it all up together and say, okay, I get it. I know why I know. I understand why I needed to go through these things. And that's what we're here. We're here to learn and to grow and to be the best people that we can be. And there's, I, I know people say, but you only had two years with your father. That's just cruel. And it is, it's cruel to like kind of dangle something in front of somebody and yank it away again. I get that, but I think of it this way, that my purpose was always on track and it's in its own time. You can't force your purpose. So I had to be here on the other side of this. And what I think of is that I was given the opportunity to know my father for two years because it may not have ever been in the plan, but I was given that insight because that's fueled me to push through and find ways to do this. That was the last key to being what I need to be right now. That's beautiful. Really, <laughs> really nice. Really, really nice to hear. I mean, I I I I just am humbled for to to just be part of this story and to be able to, you know, put as much detail as we put into this out to the you know to the big to the wide world you know through yeah. the internet what what an amazing time we what an amazing time we live in you know right now and hopefully we can affect some change but um there's no there's no reason why we can't do it with a smile on our faces as well no. so you know you can and, find happiness through all of the turmoil if i can find happiness through what i've been through and when I see parents um, and when I see other children like me, adult survivors like me, I know that they can truly have 100% authentic happiness. Mm. And it, it does take work and, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy path, but it does, it does take work, but you can replace the turmoil with happiness. I'm yeah. living proof of it. I see it. I see it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely see it. It's, it's, it's. It's it's very it's very compelling. So tell me a little bit about what uh, life is like now. Then I see you've got cats. Um, yeah, she likes to photo bomb me to... every time I go live. She's got to come in here and do something. <laughs> yeah, she's been um, uh, round in the background every now and then up on the fish tank. I thought that was yeah, hilarious. Yep. I was waiting for a moment where where she might um, uh, fish one of them out, maybe. Or for well, in my in my own in my own podcast or my own videos or my own meetings, people expect they're like waiting. Is okay. the cat gonna come in? Because she likes to jump up into the rafter up above, and <laughs> yeah, she's entertaining my my uh, my guests or my fellow companions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's nice to have that. It's brilliant. Yeah. 
Brilliant. So, um, Dawn, is there anything else you would like to, uh, is there anything else you'd like to cover off uh, on the Philip Maloney podcast today? Wow, we covered a lot of ground. Um, what was, there was something else that we wanted to, oh, was the, why I use my entire name. That's oh, yeah. another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Andrea. Andrea, yep. Andrea is my middle name. So um, I've had many names in my life as, as, as you can imagine, because my name was changed, you know, right afterwards, part of the, you know, concealing and mm. the adoptive name. And then I got married and then I decided, okay, I don't want anybody telling me what my name is. So I changed my name to something completely different. <laughs> I kept Dawn. <laughs> Dawn was still in the middle. Right. Um, but I was like, nobody's going to tell me my identity and I'm trying to find my own identity. So in 2000, I think it was 2000, eight-ish, somewhere in there, I decided I'm going to be this person instead. And I went and legally had my name changed, but it never resonated. It never really worked very well. So then in, when I found my dad in 2016, I'm like, nope, that's who I am. So I, I changed my name legally back to Don Andrea McCarty in, you know, in honor of, of him. And because he was devastated when he found out my name was changed. So the story behind Don Andrea McCarty and how, you know, because it's, it's not a common name. Andrea is not a common name at all. No. So when I was being delivered, my mom was on the, the gurney and being rolled into the labor room. And they had decided to name me Don Andrea McCarty with um, an R-E-A at the end instead of R-I-A. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be Don Andrea McCarty. And as she's being wheeled into the room, she yells back at him, make sure you use Andrea with an I or, or with the no Andrea with an E. And so he's like, okay, got it. So when he, she had passed out, so she couldn't mm -hmm. complete the paperwork. So he gets to complete the paperwork and he's filling out the name of, you know, the child. So he writes in there, he's thinking, okay, Don Andrea McCarty, that, that means her initials will be D-A-M. And he's like, I don't want her initials to be damn. <laughs> so he's like, nope, we're going to put, we'll use E. So he put E instead of A and it became Don Andrea and he left the I, he still put the I in there, even though she told yeah. him to use an E. So he actually named me in essence, you know, he, he changed the whole thing to be whatever he wanted it to be just so I wouldn't have D-A-M as my initials. So Don Andrea it is. <laughs> So that's why when I started advocating, when I started being out here on Facebook in this particular mm. role, I took on that identity because that helps me in, in reinforcing that that is who I am. I, I have always been this person. I was born that person. I was derailed throughout life as far as identity goes, but I'm back to being who I was always meant to be. So yeah. Don Andrea McCarty is who I was always intended to be. That's that's a good story around a name, if ever I've heard one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, I kind of like the fact you. that he named me. It kind of keeps me, you know, it, it's yeah. just warming. It's warming yeah. when I hear it. Like, there's not many people that have stories like that around it, especially then compounded by the rest of what your, the rest of your life turns out. That significant moment when he did that. I and mean, then I suppose you only found that out, right, when you when you were, uh, uh, uh well, my mom something. did share some of that story with me and then he confirmed and, and finished it up. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so brilliant. it's been a, it's been a journey. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, it's difficult to even put it into a sort of single shoot podcast as it were, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot. Be, there must be so many little avenues and little little directions. Oh, there's that. lots of stories. I mean, I could go on and on and on because there's so much that, you know, you're not able to share in mm. in one little podcast, like you said. So, yeah, we'll have to do uh, we'll have to do a six parter for you, Dawn. Uh, <laughs> get, get I, I'm I'm looking for a producer. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I. Do you know, I hear, I hear that a lot because, you know, uh, there's lots of people with these stories who, who, who really would like to get them out there. So, you know, if there are uh, any. One of the things I hear with my story is that 
it's not just about one little element. It's not just about like parental alienation. There's so many different elements. So my story touches on yeah. a broad spectrum of issues mm. that can be wrapped up into one. And I keep, I hear it all the time that this needs to be something that's on the screen because I believe I became the associate producer for a racing family documentary. Yes. And I believe 100% that we can change the hearts of children for the future, that children maybe now that have gone through what I've gone through, we can change the hearts of people through film. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. captive audience and you can, you can guide them through. You can tell them the story without the parents telling the story. And the more that we put out there in film and the more people can realize, oh my gosh, that's, that had to have been dif difficult. And you know what? I have a friend that went through that. And now yeah. we start a conversation. Now we're starting to inspire people to speak up and share. And eventually, the more that are speaking up and sharing, the more we're going to touch the hearts that need to be warmed. Because mm -hmm. they're, 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 sec they're um, sectioned off. They're cold. They don't have any spark in there for that particular component of their life. Yeah. But film can warm their heart even if they're the ones sitting in the audience, they can relate. There's somebody out there that can relate to one aspect or more of my story. So because of that broadness, it's not just about that piece or this piece. I can, I can deliver a lot of relation to certain people. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, it's very true. And, and, and film does do that. Even, even, even to you know this this modern time, you know, even even a thirty second TikTok sometimes can can be enough as well to just sort of capture that one person to look at it and go, do you know what? Yeah, that's that's me too, you know. Mm -hmm. I think me too's already been coined though, hasn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's... there might be a different meaning. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. yeah, but that's I mean, you know, yeah, I think I think if there's if there's anybody just make make movies about it, uh, do podcasts about it, spread the word, get the message. You know, one thing that I do say is this isn't, this doesn't belong to me. This belongs to everybody. You know, what, the, the, the message it's, it's, it's really, um, bigger than it's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. There's a, there's a full society around mm -hmm. the world, which are really suffering from this bizarre distortion in, in, yeah, in, I talk in to people society. all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. And you know, it's it's funny that you say it's bigger than you, it's bigger than me, and it's true. And this is why I'm sharing because if I sit on this story, nothing will ever change. Mm -hmm. Not at my hand, or not at you know, for me trying to make a difference in this world. So, the first year I started sharing this after my dad passed away, um, it was a struggle. I was really having a hard time. And I actually had some run-ins with some pretty vicious people mm. that questioned who I was, which if you know anything about me and my identity, the last thing you should do is question me about who I am. So I've had that happen twice. And the first time nearly, nearly made me walk away. The first time I was like, I don't need this. I don't need to stick my neck out here, sharing my story, reliving it over and over and over again trying to help parents find hope, trying to help kids see the need to face their reality. Mm. I don't need all that. But then someone reached in and said, no, you need to, um, you, we, we need you to keep working on this. And actually um, Ginger Gentile, who is the director of the Erasing Family Film, she's one of them that said, no, wow. we need to hear your voice. So that kept me going and I, I stuck it out and I became the chair for the Ch um, National Parents Organization here of the state of Florida in 2019, starting to try and help in different ways. And then sharing my story once I locked, once I locked in, and that's, that's what made the difference, locking in who, who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now, it's really hard to argue with me about my opinion or my position because I, yeah. I have the child's perspective and there's nobody out there except for other people like me that can even touch that. 
Mm. You can't tell me how I felt or how I didn't felt because you didn't live my life. You can't tell yeah. me that it exists or it doesn't exist or it's invalid or it is valid because you haven't lived that life. I have. And, you know, so that makes me more, I feel more powerful yeah. having that to guide me as I share my story now. So I'm not as inhibited in there's sharing a real, it. Yeah, there's a real value to your um to your experiences in bringing in children and bringing in young people who are, you know, find themselves at the forefront of these issues, you know, mm -hmm. because they don't know what's happening to them, like day to day. Right. They don't, they, they can't see it because you didn't see it. You thought that was your, you know, you were like happy to see your mum. Your mum grabs you and chucks you in a car and says, this is your new daddy. So then you don't go, hang on a minute, I'm calling the cops, right? You yeah, know, right. <laughs> you're, not, you're not equipped to do that as a, as a, as a, as a four-year-old, as an eight-year-old, as a 12-year-old, you're not, you don't have those, you, you know, you don't have the armory to do that. So now you're giving your message. I, I feel there's a huge value in you being able to, mm -hmm. you know, I think of, um, I think of all the people that I've spoken to and what it would have been if their children as well would have just had an avenue to this kind of um, understanding as to what is what is going on and why it's not it's not always cool not to see daddy and it's not always cool not to see mummy right. um, just because you're given this one sided story of we just don't we just don't yeah. do that and then and, and, we, and we don't go into it we don't discuss it we don't talk about it it's just taboo within the family because normally once you sort of scratch the surface on those yeah. kind of on those kind of answers you so tend to dig up a, a bit of a stink need. yeah i think that's a very valid point that when you brought up that you got this one-sided story and if, if you know anything about making an informed decision, you know that you need to have your research in front of you. You know you need to know both sides of what's happening. To You know, you're doing that every day. Anytime you go to vote, you should know both sides, both candidates, right? You should understand what they stand for, or what they don't stand for. So why would you allow one of your parents to hold the keys to your belief system yeah. instead of having the informed decision on what your values are, what you believe and don't believe, and who you are as an adult now, why wouldn't you want to have all of the information at your fingertips so that you can make those informed decisions about one or the other? And also I think it's important to realize that um, a lot of people think I should hate my mother. Mm. And I, I don't hate my mother. I no, don't approve of not. what she did. I don't like what she did, but I also can see and I can recognize that she had her own childhood trauma and that she had her own issues with her childhood growing up and who who she became. So mm. did she make the right decisions? No, absolutely mm. not. But was it always her fault? Not necessarily, because we only do what we know mm. and you repeat what you've been taught. So we were in this transgenerational cycle and yeah. until it stopped it it never changes so no i don't hate my mother i don't like what she did we don't have a very strong relationship but we do have one mm. and i haven't walked away from her and i haven't put her in the light of this because i don't want people taking out their own anger because of their situation and applying mm. that towards mm. mine because you can't do that you can't cross yeah. that over you know, I'm the only one that can hold her accountable for what she did. Yeah. Nobody else can. And I think that it's only fair for the child to see both parents in the same balanced way where they were not perfect. They were never supposed to be. Nobody has a perfect parent. You might have a lucky situation where life is great and that's wonderful, but your parent was still never perfect. And we've made mistakes. I'm not a perfect parent. In fact, I've made mistakes that I wish I, I hadn't have done. But my kids, you know, they turned out great. And kids have to get rid of the idea that these parents had to have been perfect in order to be a parent. Because mm. that's not the most imperfect people can still be parents. 
so yeah i mean there's it's so multifaceted um that anybody looking for perfection is 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 going to be it's going to be sadly disappointed i mean one of the things that i um have re more recently sort of come to terms with and 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 looked at understanding is the sort of is the philosophy that life is suffering right you know um mm -hmm. you hear you hear you hear people saying that and i and i've i've heard it throughout my life you know uh life is suffering i've heard it you know as a as a catholic I, you know you sort of <laughs> you sort of embrace the suffering of life um mm -hmm. but it's your it's birth only, right <laughs> yeah it's only really made sense to sort of once you recognize that life is suffering and you accept that life is suffering you can then find those little nuggets of beauty and love and things that you're going to cherish and then you know so like when you do see your father it snaps into mm -hmm. clarity you know right things, things fall into place and yeah it's probably a bit rubbish that it was 44 years but I'm sure looking back now you kind of like go what 44 years you know almost almost right oh you know I I I can look back and I think that seems like such a different world, a total mm. different lifetime where 2016 was only five years ago. Yeah. And that doesn't seem like th that world is so far away from what I have right now. And it's really hard to imagine how much has changed um, since then. Mm. You know, 44 years now that it's gone, it's like, oh, wow, five years ago seems like forever. Uh, you know, so it kind of removes the 44 length, you know, the, yeah. the imagining that length of time because five years has transitioned into, I mean, transformation is probably the word of the day. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's been an amazing transformation mm. and it does reduce the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The duration that yeah. wondering about how long that yeah, really Yeah, because there's a perception. There's a perception when you're yeah. treading water for 44 years in the unknown and in the murky water, five years of clarity is like, pff, it's like, yeah, yeah it's comparable. That's nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's amazing to be able to come out of that. So yeah, when you say children are resilience, this is what resilience looks like. Mm -hmm. not turning 18 as like a rite of passage and all of a sudden the world's yeah. great again. Yeah. You know, that, that doesn't exist. That's a myth, but the real rite of passage is when you come into your own finally and you're out from underneath the control of one parent, the enmeshment that kind of guides your belief system, your mm -hmm. values, your morals, your standards, what you believe about the other parent, you can't, make an informed decision if your decision is still based on what they say it is. Yeah. So when you come into your own and you really, really want to be your own person outside of mom or dad, that's, that's the transformation. That's the amazing piece. Yeah. So. No, totally. Oh, it's been, it's been such a joy. It's been such a joy and such a pleasure. Well, I am so glad that that we were able to spend this time. It's been what two hours, two and a half hours. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, we're we're, <laughs> we're cracking on. Not my longest podcast, not my longest podcast, but uh, I'm sure there's people out there. I mean, you know, you look at the sort of you look at the statistics and what have you of like who, how how long people watch for and what have you. But I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The reason that I want to have a long in-depth conversation is because I believe it has um there's there's a justice that I have to do your story that isn't 15 minutes long you know there is a nuance right. there like you you know you you have to you have to tell us about Sammy Davis Jr right you have to tell us about um you know uh uh what was going on in your father's life and what was going on in your mother's life, et cetera, et cetera. And, you, you know, and your stepdad and what have you. So there's a lot of nuanced um, elements to, for people to be able to understand. So I quite exactly. like it. I quite like it. You know, I like, I, I like that. Hopefully somebody's just sort of 
got their headphones in and they're and they're and they're learning about your story and it resonates with them. Speaking of the the nuances and the little you know side stories, is there anything that you need clarity on as far as what I why I discuss parts of it or not? Can um, we bring it all back into the fold? Yeah, I believe so. I think if there was anything that felt untied, um, you know, I don't think that uh, would be detrimental to to the basis of the story. Um, okay. You know, there's obviously um, no. I don't. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that's sort of hanging out there as 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 being sort of glaringly obvious. To, to understand, apart from the fact that you didn't discover Facebook and its and and and, and its merits to uh, finding people soon enough. That's you a know. phenomenon all in itself, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess Get I was a little Facebook overprotected. Dawn. My kids were raised with CSI, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but hey, you know, I mean, we live and we live and learn, don't we? Um, but yeah, no, that aside, I don't think I don't think there's anything that um, would uncover. But by all means, if there are any viewers out there that need some clarity or need some sort of dots um, connected, then 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 stick it in the comments and, we, and we'll do it again, Dawn. You know, absolutely, we can, would be we happy can... to come back for a second. Take a round. <laughs> cover off any of those bits and pieces. Well, move, moving forward with the with 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 the podcast, I'm um, you you might be interested to to know, and um, if you would ever like to, I'd be really happy if you could be a a guest at some point in um, my next venture, which is like a magazine type podcast where I'm having a panel of guests um, in. All, all, all manner of subjects, really, but um, it's going to be around the sort of family courts, parental alienation, etc. And we're going to be looking at discussing, you know, different aspects. So um, I'm recording one um, uh, this quarter, which is, which you know, obviously I have the panel; it's all prepared. Um, but you know, next quarter, quarter after, or what have you, you know, I'll be looking at doing, um, be looking at doing other things. And maybe that uh, sounds uh, fun. Someday we can, yeah, we could, we could hopefully fit you in there, and you can come and tell us about your cyber security, um, oh, yeah. et, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I'd be happy to. That that sounds very fun. That would be a, very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that would be that would be my pleasure. Um, so I guess with with that, um, Dawn, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, participating in the Philip Maloney podcast and being so open and honest and telling your story. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share more about it to help bring awareness and, and prevent this from going forward. Absolutely. Dawn, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. On a train and a bus in a car on the way to your job all along with your kids, with your wife, or with your dog. You can listen anywhere. You can listen everywhere. To the Philip Malone Podcast.